get starting. My talk is all about language and how accents uh, and language shape and form our identity. And um, those of you with perhaps an ear for an accent may have already formed an impression of my identity just from what I've been saying so far. <clears throat> um, and um, I may even fool some of you into believing that uh, I'm more sophisticated than I really am. <clears throat> but uh, it was uh, George Orwell that said in the 1930s that all Englishmen are branded on the tongue from birth, um, that you could tell so much about someone from the moment they opened their mouth in particular, uh, not just the region of England from which they came, but also the uh, social class they aspired to. Uh, my parents uh, both come from working class backgrounds at uh, opposite ends of um, England. Uh, my father from the suburbs in civil service of London and uh, my mother from a northern mining town. And growing up, neither of my parents would have sounded like me at all. In fact, my accent owes nothing to their geography or to their class. Uh, now, all this talk of class... Um, it was a century ago that uh, George Bernard Shaw wrote that um, no Englishman can open his mouth without another despising him. Um, and it's still remarkably true today, 100 years on, that uh, so much um, is judged uh, um, in England by the way you speak. Um, assumptions about pretension and status are all formed based on your language. And I was born in the town of Macclesfield, which is at the uh, perfect uh, center point of my parents' origins. In the 2004 uh, Times newspaper survey in England, it was listed as the most culturally deprived town in England. Um, but it's a town with a rich cultural history that dates back as far as the 1086 Doomsday Survey of the land um, during the time of William the Conqueror. And at that time, the 11th century, it fell within the borders of the 100 of Hammerston, which sounds sort of Game of Thrones, but it, it, um, it's just the old English uh, word meaning a division of land that houses 100 homesteads. And the reason I mention this is because it's sort of the perfect uh, pronunciation test for um, aspiration, the uh, aspirate. Uh, in England, so much depends on it, the H sound. Uh, those who drop their H's are considered um, unforgivably crude and working class. And growing up in Macclesfield, I uh, adopted its regional accent, so... Um, to me, it was the 100 Ermsteads of Amiston, um, and there's a particularly snobby class of people who would uh, sort of turn their nose up at that in England. And that touches on a long um, history of anxiety over the letter H um, in England. And there's so much concern over it that, in fact, um, H has now become a legal variant of the letter form in British English. Um, and one theory for this is just that school children who are being repeatedly told not to drop their H's have hypercorrected and added them where they really just don't exist at all. And in the early 19th century, the words hotel, hospital, and herb were all actually pronounced without the H in Britain. Um, now, um, it's, it's interesting uh, and, um, how that's changed. Uh, I mean, America has actually clung on to its H-less herb, and that's perhaps because it has less class, less, less class anxiety associated with its language. But let's not stop at H. This talk is also brought to you by the letter R. Um, when I introduce myself to Canadians, sometimes they have a hard time picking up my name. I've had Mac and uh, Mock and even Mog. Um, and that's because my very ordinary name, Mark, sits on a, a sort of an in, important pronunciation divide in our languages, the letter R, what they call uh, roticism. And some mistake, mistakenly believe that um, Canadian English has actually diverged from the original British English, but in fact the reverse is true, um, that British English was once rhotic. Um, and it was only after the American War of Independence that Brits began to drop their R's. It's a sort of a joke. It's a, an, an ass or an ass here. Um, and one of the reasons, the main reasons for this is because um, during that time, the uh, 19th century, the upper classes were reacting against the, the new rich um, who brought with them a great deal of... They were powering the, the Industrial Revolution. They brought a great deal of social... Um, uh, sort of, they brought a lot of wealth with them, but potentially not social honor. So the upper class began to codify their language in order to separate themselves, distinguish themselves. Now, Canadians have held on to their R's, but they haven't adopted the British phenomenon of the U and the non-U, um, the uh, non-upper class words on the left and the upper class variants of them on the right. And this comes from a 1950s essay published by the linguist Alan Ross that sets out these differences in cultural vocabulary and social vocabulary. It's, uh, the middle classes on the left, uh, represented by uh, Kate and uh, Will on the right, uh, the upper class version. Um, and this sort of touched on a, a, a big anxiety in that time in the middle classes who were eager for, um, to climb um, in their social standings. So the, the echoes of this impact are still, still reverberating in British English today. Now language is continually evolving and um, each generation speaks differently to the one before. 
um, the uh, younger and older generations are continually jostling and jousting over um, pronunciation divides like H and H, and whether it's dessert or pudding. Um, but English adapts. It's a, a very fluid language. Not all are as lucky to evolve and adapt as quickly. Um, some are at the whims of, his, of, sort of history and um, the circumstances of, of their politics. Um, my family left England when I was eight years old, and we moved to Luxembourg, a country uh, one-third the size of the GTA that's nestled here between France, Germany, and, and Belgium. Well, it's still nestled there. Um, and um, I went to a European school, which is sort of a, a, a Tower of Babel of languages. There were 11 languages taught in my school. And um, my English accent and my vocabulary are very shaped by that um, experience and that environment. And some English people actually argue that I don't really have an accent. I speak a sort of an in international English, but that's really not true. Everybody has an accent, uh, except perhaps the mute. Um, and uh, there are 7,000 languages in the world today. Um, and some say there may only be 1,000 by the end of this century. Uh, some languages... Um, I spoke Luxembourgish growing up. Luxembourg is very proud and um, protective of its language. I spoke it with my village friends. Um, I lived in a village. And um, <laughs> Sorry, I lost my place. Um, so uh, I wanted to say here that uh, Luxembourgish is, um, is now on the endangered UNESCO language of, um, list. Um, and when a language dies, it's incredibly sad. It's like the death of a species. Mi voda bleven mot in Luxembourg, which means we wish to remain who we are. Um, and I think language is incredibly important. Um, and I just wanted to end on a quote from Clemenceau, who said that he was a, a patriot but not a nationalist. And people asked him to get the French prime minister to clarify. And he said, uh, um, I think a patriot loves this country, but a nationalist hates others. I feel like we should all be very patriotic of our own language, but respectful um, of the identities um, and influence of others. Thank you.